each candidate will now have two minutes to introduce themselves, and we'll begin with Nora Campos, and we will be going in alphabetical order. Good evening. Um, my name is Nora Campos, and I am a former assembly member. I had the opportunity to serve in the assembly for six years, and then I was termed out. Um, a lot of you may remember that I also served on the city council and served there for 10 years. And through uh, the leadership with my colleagues on the city council, we were able to accomplish a lot of great things in the city of San Jose. We built uh, affordable housing. We made sure that our parks were healthy. We created trails. We build um, a transit system that works for people that live in San Jose. So we did wonderful things. So when I went to the assembly, I had a base to work from. And so in the assembly, I was able to champion pay equity, housing issues, uh, strengthen California's climate change policies, uh, create college opportunities for California dreamers, uh, raise the minimum wage, what we had done here first in the city of San Jose. And one of the things as an assembly member, what I will continue to do is make sure that pre-K through 12 is a priority for all Californians. Make sure that higher education, if you as a Californian want to go to college, you will have that opportunity. Remove any of the barriers that prevent you from doing that. Um, and we'll work on creating affordable housing in District 15 by making sure that we remove any red tape that prevents affordable housing being built on transit corridors. Um, I hope that this evening you get an opportunity to know who I am and where I stand on the issues. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dave Cortez, Santa Clara County Supervisor. Um, I've served on the Board of Supervisors now since 2008. Um, prior to that, I was a member of the San Jose City Council, um, served uh, two years as Vice Mayor of the City of San Jose um, during Chuck Reed's first uh, term in office as Mayor. Um, prior to that, I was a member of the East Side Union High School District Board of Trustees for two four-year terms. Um, which is a, a part-time elected position. Um, and um, I was at the, at the same time for um, my day job uh, practicing law and running a family real estate invest, investment business that um, goes back about 100 years to the agricultural days of the valley. I come from an old orchard farming family here. So I'm well acquainted with Will Glenn. Um, I have campaigned citywide before in 2014. So I've been in this room and and certainly participating in candidate forums um, in the past here. I'm looking forward to the questions that you're gonna to ask today. Um, and I'm very excited to be um, running for State Senate because so much of what we've worked on at the county, on the Board of Supervisors recently, um, education issues, immigration issues, homelessness, I, I co-chaired the Measure A, $950 million housing bond, climate, um, so many issues that we've worked on locally and been very successful on and innovated on here in Santa Clara County are absolutely ripe for action um, at the state level. So again, I'm looking forward to uh, answering the questions uh, uh, today and um, I'll pass the mic along. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Tim Yoldersleeve and I have not run for elected office. There's no hiding that at all. There's two of us that have not held elected office. Um, but what motivates me for running is I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and his second commandment is to love one's neighbor as oneself. And that is a teaching that I take seriously on a personal basis and on a daily basis every single day. That is my prime motivation. What this, but what being elected to office would allow me to do is to broaden that ability to help as many people as possible that I could, could. Jesus also said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. That's a policy in my life, to serve people. Um, two things that are, I'd like to mention, is I'm not taking any money. I've run for office, this is my fourth run for office. It's allowed me to get some name recognition running previously. I'm never gonna take any money running for office. My allegiance will be strictly to the voters, never to any money. Also, I'm a renter. 
in the California legislature, there is no renters. If any of you are renters, you don't have any renters except for one that was Todd Gloria, who's now running for San Diego mayor. There are no renters in Sacramento. I would be the only renter, unless other renters are running in the legislature if I were in there. Um, the things I would like to see is I'd like to see tuition-free education. I think Nora mentioned a little bit about that. I would like to see universal health care. I'd like to, both of those are human rights. I'd like to see housing recognized as a human right. Nobody should be out in the streets. And if the private sector discriminates against those who are in their 40s and 50s then, and they have made a good attempt to try to get a job once they've been unemployed, the government should provide them for a job. Nobody in their 40s and 50s should be discriminated against for being unable to find a job once they get laid off. Thank you. Hello, my name is Johnny Camus. I am an immigrant to the United States. I came here from Beirut, Lebanon. We came here uh, as refugees when I was eight years old. So when I came to the United States, I had to learn a new language. Uh, my parents and I were in very you know, poor shape. We lived in low-income housing and rent-controlled housing when I was younger. Uh, grew up right here, though, in San Jose. I went to Oak Grove High School. I struggled uh, to build, uh, to help myself uh, actually worked my way through college working at Safeway food stores, got a business degree, and I became a financial advisor for 19 years. And I, it compelled me to, what compelled me to get into public office is the fact that I, I thought our city was going downhill. We, we had um, been overspending on many things, and then, and, which ended up in layoffs, huge layoffs. And so I wanted to get in there and find out why we're spending the money the way we are, why aren't we getting results from the, and why are we having to close our libraries, you know, uh, four days a week, and our parks, and, and, and lay off officers, and, and do the things that happened before I got into office. So since I've been in office, I have been an advocate for making sh fiscal responsibility a priority for our city. I've found lots of pockets of money. I've saved uh, lots of money, and I made sure uh, that we spend our money, when we do spend our money, we, we, we have some ways to, to measure uh, the success that we have. And I'm running for state senate because I'm tired of the state. Uh, you know, this is one of the highest tax states in, in the United States, and I don't see results. I don't see results with beautiful roads when we have huge taxes that we pay on roads. I don't see results when we pay so much money um, for our school system and yet is like one of the last in the country. I don't see results when it comes to um, housing the homeless uh, people. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to get in, into office, find out how we're spending our money, and, and, and I look forward to answering questions as well. Thank you. Ready? Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Ravel, and thank you to the Willow Glen Neighborhood Association. I'm the only one at this table who actually lived in Willow Glen. I, I went to Edwin Markham and Willow Glen High School a couple years ago, but and my first house after I got married to my husband, who was my classmate at Willow Glen High School, uh, was here in Willow Glen, not too far from where we are. So I care a lot about this community as well. Um, in my career, I have worked for 30 years at the County of Santa Clara as the County Council and ultimately was the County Council appointed by the Board of Supervisors. In 2009, President Obama saw the affirmative work that I had done and the programs that I have started and appointed me to the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., working for Eric Holder as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General overseeing consumer work and other things that I did to help protect the rights of people in this country. Um, I was then appointed by Governor Brown as the chair of the California Fair Political Practices Commission. Uh, where uh, I pretty famously uh, did the only case ever against the Koch brothers for dark money that came into an election in California and beat them. Nobody else has beat them yet. Um, 
then because of that, really, President Obama asked me to come back and go to the Federal Election Commission. Since then, I've done a number of things when I came back at the beginning of the uh, Trump administration. But what occurred to me was we need to get things done here, and I get things done. Things have not been done that should have been done by either the state or local officials. Welcome candidates, outstanding opening statements. Uh, for timing, you'll notice the American flag here at the table. We'll flag you about five seconds, 10 seconds prior, and then if you keep going, I'll just simply say the word time. I uh, want to thank uh, Elizabeth and Deanna for organizing the event of the Will Glenn Neighborhood Association. As Deanna commented, this is for State Senate. This position is not the City Council. It is not the federal government. It is the state. These uh, representatives will have one vote in the Senate. They'll have one vote at the committee level. And uh, that's the important thing to keep in mind. Uh, on the, we mentioned timing. I'll rotate the questions so you don't always have one person going first. Um, the 30 second rebuttal is meant to be a conversation. It's not to meant to be extending your answer, but it should be uh, stated to someone. It doesn't have to be adversarial. It just means I would like to comment on what someone else said. That's the intent of the rebuttal, which is allowed on every single question. And finally, the closing will be in reverse alphabetical order. So when we get to the close, it'll start with Anne and finish with Nora. So for our first question, looking at the list here, uh, when you're elected state senator, you're going to receive a budget, and you're going to be able to open up an office. Our current state senator has an office in Campbell. Our state assembly member has an office in Cupertino. You have a choice, assuming all rents are equal. Where would you locate your office, starting with Johnny Camus? Well, I'd, I'd like to have it somewhere we can have a reverse commute. So I would be looking in, in this area or in the Almaden Valley or, or uh, maybe in, in the District 9 area. Uh, Nora? Thank you for the question. And I would actually um, not use taxpayers' money and keep my office at the current uh, facility that is owned by the state of California because it's rent-free and not use taxpayers' money and stay at downtown's uh, facility. OK. Um, first of all, um, I don't have a lot of wealth, so I would have to have the office up in uh, Sacramento. But I'm going to let the voters decide where they would like the office. I, I, there could be anywhere the voters want me to. I intend to do a town hall meeting in the very beginning to find out what the voters want and where you would like me located. I would love to be over where, where my job uh, area is over by East Ridge. I'd love to have an office over there. I don't think anybody has ever really considered that. Thank you. I want to be someplace that's central for all the people who live in this valley. And what is more central than Willow Glen? And what is better than Lincoln Avenue across from my favorite Pete's? Well, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that much yet, uh, other than, you know, for the last two minutes here, um, been more focused on the issues um, that we're dealing with here and at the state level. but. Uh, most certainly, I would want to be located um, in a very transit-friendly location. Um, I think people can get where they need to go here, albeit uh, through too much congestion right now with vehicles. Um, but there are a lot of people who are transit-dependent, um, people who want information have every right to visit their, their state senator, their state senate office, um, irrespective of, of whether they drive um, or whether they need bike lanes um, or, or whether they need to ride on a bus. So. Um, that'll, that'll all go into my final decision. Thank you. Great. Our next question, as a senator, would you support legislation that conflicts with recent voter ballot measures? For example, California voters voted no on rent control in 2018, but legislation was recently approved to enact. Or something similar, voters recently voted in favor of the death penalty, but governor has placed a moratorium on it. And that question would go to Nora. I would not um, support any legislation that would uh, overturn what the voters of California would like to see. And then go in that way. Tim? Okay, I agree. I don't like the idea of overturning legislation, but I want to say something about the rent control. I'm not sure voters really understood that that wasn't really 
by Proposition 10 wasn't really directly talking about rent control. It was simply giving the power to the local muni municipalities, and then the local municipalities would make the decision whether they wanted to have rent control or not. Uh, if they chose not to, then it wouldn't happen. For instance, in San Jose, if San Jose decided not to expand the rent control, it wouldn't happen. Proposition, and I, so I want to just make that statement, but I wouldn't want to go against the will of the voters. The capital punishment made me mad because California voters have time and time again said that they want that, and it would like me, to me, to, in, to go against a vote, voter's will would be like me saying, everybody bow down to Jesus. I mean, I can't force somebody to do what I want, my personal decisions as a representative. I've got to do what the voters want, so I was very angry about that. Thank you. We have to remember that initiatives on the ballot are often funded by big money, by corporate interests, and they're not really grassroots initiatives, many of them. And there is another factor that's really important. If you all remember Prop 8, a lot of people misunderstood what the voting yes or voting no what meant on Prop 8. And and that's how a lot of those ballot measures are framed. They're not really clear. There's so many of them on the ballot that people don't understand it. And so my view is it's important to do the right thing. It's important to be ethical, honest, and do what needs to be done for the people of this state on their behalf. And that's what a representative is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not um, absolutely opposed to voting for legislation that would alter um, what happened in a referendum process, which I think is a question. Um, where I'd be least likely to do that is where there are fiscal consequences. Um, I think um, oftentimes where the voters are most clear in the referendum process is, is when there's dollars attached, when they're trying to say, I don't want that tax, or I do want this tax, or uh, they, they, they read well enough to understand that um, the legislative analyst has said there's going to be a huge fiscal impact to whatever that particular item is. Uh, on something like rent control, um, you know, we've had competing measures back and forth for years, and I think there are times when the legislature puts itself uh, together in a, in, a, in a spirit of, of compromise with industry. I thought it was interesting there that one of the largest real estate um, associations in the state actually supported the measure. So, so, so sometimes legislation works better. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, tread lightly on changing any ballot measure. Uh, to, so, for example, you may you can probably see this if you get the spotlight. I'll be quoted in, a, in an article tomorrow, um, questioning the decision for uh, Governor Newsom to. Uh, basically do an executive order to change the money that was promised on gasoline taxes to go to pavement maintenance and and move them to um, to environmental uh, and rail I think that taxpayers said that they're willing to pay these things over and over again on, my, on prop six and yet the legislature and the governor saw fit to change the will of the vote I don't think that's fair and it's not fair to the voters and I think it dilutes the public trust when you do things like this. So I, I, I would tread extremely lightly in changing the will of the voters. Next question starting with Tim. California is the highest income tax of all the 50 states. Do you believe the current state income tax rate is high, low, or just right? Does this reflect how you would vote regarding proposed tax changes? Okay. First of all, uh, we'll ha I'll have to see a good study on the tax rates, what, where they are right now. I would lean more toward a progressive tax. I, I work with a lot of low-income people. I don't think the idea of a flat rate tax, I'm very, I don't think that would really work. And we have a lot of income inequality. So I'm going to lean toward tax structure that is going to support lower-income people and, and level the playing field. However, my, the voters of this district overrule me. So if the voters don't want me to go that direction, I'll just, I won't. Uh, but that's my preferred way would be to be a progressive tax that um, helps lower income people, lessens the income inequality. And as far as what, wh whether this is, whether the current level is good or bad or not, I'd have to look further at the data. Thank you.
There's no question that California has a high um, income tax, um, particularly as it uh, is utilized to the people who are at the higher levels of income, um, because that's how the state has balanced its budget for many years. Um, I think that the reason California has a high income tax is because we actually have so many services to the public that many other states don't. I was just in New Hampshire that does not have uh, a tax, and uh, it's kind of amazing how little they have there. Uh, it's a small state, of course. Um, so, you know, budgeting for the state, I believe, uh, needs to be done with a lot of oversight, and one of the things that we must do is think of better ways to fund what we need to fund. Yeah, I, I have not um, supported or, or considered um, or had to consider supporting a state income tax increase yet. Um, at this particular time, um, knowing that the bulk of uh, state revenue, the state income tax goes to education, I would be um, very reluctant to, to reduce the revenue that's coming in. Um, I do think there are other ways, um, and we've talked about some of those already during this campaign, to, to fund public education. Um, we are, by most accounts, uh, second to the last among the 50 states in per capita funding for, for students. Um, we have the people that are on the first five years of the salary schedule and the teacher salary schedule here um, in, in our valley are, are basically below the federally adjusted poverty rate in terms of, of income. So I'd be reluctant to, to mess around with the state income tax right now at a time when huge amounts of money are being poured into uh, infrastructure, uh, housing, uh, and we need to preserve that money for education, I think, at this time. Well, I got to tell you, as a financial advisor, uh, you actually are uh, not able to deduct a lot of the state taxes that you used to before the federal government changed its tax policy. So technically, you're actually paying a lot more taxes now than you used to because you, couldn't de you can't deduct more interest uh, on your home, for example. Uh, and so, and you can't deduct the tax burden either that you used to be able to uh, um, above $10,000. So a lot of people are paying a lot more taxes this year than they ever have. I think a lot of us, a lot of us are feeling tax burden. I'll put myself in that um, category. And the state's got to learn to live within its fiscal budget. I think uh, we keep looking for new ways to tax uh, the public and not seeing results. I mean, I'm, I'm not one of those people who is against taxes. However, I want to see results from those taxes, and I am not seeing those right now. And so raising, raising taxes at this point, regard, if it's income or if it's anything else, I think needs to not go. I um, would leave it where it's at right now. And if we're talking about the quality of life that we have here in California or in Silicon Valley, um, it, it provides a strong infrastructure for us to be able to live here and uh, have the necessities that we need to have healthy families and healthy communities. So I would not do anything to change um, the, the, the tax uh, infrastructure right now. And um, hopefully, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the gas. Uh, I was in the assembly when that came to a vote. And there were a lot of us that thought uh, we should go to the voters uh, because we didn't want to impose um, another tax that could um, hurt uh, families that did not have the means to be able to pay for the gasoline at the price it is. So uh, I would not uh, be supportive at, at today in, in changing anything. Okay. Next question, starting with Anne. According to National Public Ra Radio, NPR, property tax revenues have grown 1,000% since 1978 when Prop 13 was passed. Do you support modifying Prop 13? If so, how? I do support modifying Prop 13. Um, I uh, first started working at the county when Prop 13 was first um, on the ballot. And I know that it was sold for the purpose of making sure that seniors could afford to stay in their homes and not have outrageously high property tax bills. It was not sold for the purpose of giving a benefit to 
the big corporations and big businesses in California. So my view about Prop 13 is that there should be a split role, but that it take into account the businesses that might be negatively affected by it, that is smaller businesses that are pass, being passed on, the uh, costs of the tax, and it would put low income, many immigrant uh, businesses out of business, and that's what I would do. Yeah, I appreciate, Pierre Luigi, I appreciate your, you know, you're citing the statistics, and, and I would just say in context that, uh, you know, property tax being related to property values, I mean, who would have thought that we'd be looking at median home prices that we're looking at now back in the day, uh, back in 1978, 79, when, when Prop 13 um, was put into place. Uh, I think my parents' home was valued at something like $30,000 at that time, um, and, uh, you know, if it was still there today, um, it was torn down, but it was still there today, I, I'm pretty sure it would have a market value of about 1.4 million, which is pretty typical around here. Um, so, of course, property taxes have gone up, um, b corresponding to, to, to value as, as those properties turn over and as they're sold, more and more revenue comes in, even under Prop 13. Um, the adjustment that I'm interested in, and, and um, I've said I, I'll support the ballot measure unless it's changed significantly in the meantime, and that is split role um, that's dedicated, again, to education. Um, and, you know, I'm, I've been involved in commercial property all my life, so I don't want to have an unfair burden on commercial properties, but um, we need to take a look at what we can do for education funding. So in the end, if you change Prop 13, it's going to hurt all of you. So if you, if you, if if you're going to change split row and all these shopping centers have to increase the prices because all their tax rates are going to go up and then they're going to charge more to the targets and to the, the faux places and to the dry cleaners and to all those things that, that actually affect your life. So the, end, the people who end up paying for these higher taxes when you tax businesses is you. The businesses will either stay in business and continue making the same amount of profit and charge you more or they'll go out of business. Those are the two options that businesses have. So if I think we should stay within our means and not mess with the property tax um, equation so because in the end, it won't hurt the corporations. The corporations will live with it or leave. And the, if you live with it, that means you're raising your own costs. This actually has been a discussion for many years whether we should uh, change Prop 13. When I was in the assembly, we, we talked about this as well. And we didn't do anything back then because people had concerns about um, areas that were very expensive to live in. And if we eliminated it and changed it, uh, how would it affect uh, uh, home, home ownership for individuals that live within high cost areas like here in Silicon Valley. We know that uh, if you bought your home many years ago and your children are at, at age and you're able to pass it on, um, then your child is able to live here in Silicon Valley. Very few families are able to actually live here because of the cost. That's why people commute. Um, but I, when we talk about split role, I was very, very clear about this in, in every debate that we've been to, that I would not support split role if it affects small businesses like the ones that we frequently go to on um, Lincoln. Okay, I just missed the opportunity, if you want to call it that, for voting no on Proposition 13, which I would have done if I had been able to vote at that time. All of the concerns about it came to fruition, especially in regards to education. But now we've got it. I want to also mention that our, I'm going to reference an article here from the San Francisco Chronicle, Joe Garafil, July 6th. Uh, he mentions that Larry Stone, our county assessor, actually voted no on Proposition 13. So I'm in favor of this reform. Uh, as Nora mentioned, I'm against having small businesses affected by it. That's my concern. I, I had a chance to work at a small business for many years, for 10 years as a manager. So that's my concern on it. 
Also, uh, Larry Stone mentions that there's going to be a lot of logistics nightmares in trying to get the assessors to be able to assess all the properties every three years. But I will support the reform because it'll bring education some more money. Thank you. Uh, next question starts with Dave. Do you think Proposition 47, passed in 2014, and Proposition 57, passed in 2016, has led to increased crime? I think in this county, um, I think we're a little bit of an exception um, with those propositions as well as with um, something called AB 109, which uh, puts the supervision of, of certain um, what would be parolees um, under local county probation supervision instead of under state parole officers. You know, in that case, we, we've created a reentry center here that intercepts inmates um, that are coming out of state prison within the first 48 hours of, of release so that they're just not out on the street with $200 and no place to go and basically to, to try to intercept them before recidivism begins, before a reoffense occurs in. And we've been successful. The rate of, of incarceration, uh, the rate of reoffense uh, prior to those measures, prior to us creating the reentry center was about 70%. Um, we are now um, um, at a point where 65% of, of those same uh, releasees um, are, are not reoffending. So the problem is in the other 57 counties, especially the poorer counties, the counties that can't afford to have reentry centers, um, there's a big problem. And, and we need to look at that, and I will look at that as a state senator. I, I actually oppose Prop 47 and 57 because uh, th there's a lot of unintended consequences. We, you just heard that uh, Dave thinks that people aren't reoffending. It's just that they are reoffending. It's just that the crimes are now misdemeanors, not felonies. So that the statistics are not worth looking at because you're comparing apples to oranges. Uh, crime has gone up. I mean, if you, we can't. Our s police department can't prosecute somebody for for. Um, uh, breaking into your car, breaking into 20 cars, as long as each car didn't have more than $950 worth of stolen uh, stuff out of it. Our police are catching people left and right. In fact, I tell you, in my own district, we caught four people just yesterday. They're out today um, uh, from, from, uh, from burglaries. So the fact of the matter is, the system is broken, and I'm supporting another ballot measure called Safer California Act that will reverse some of the, the, the problems that are being caused by 47 and 57. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you think Proposition 47 passed in 2014 and Proposition 57 passed in 2016 has led to increased crime? You know, I was in the assembly when we um, were discussing these, and um, when they passed, uh, I was still there. And in reflecting now, um, as it has been in practice, that if we are at the state level going to mandate uh, early release and individuals into go, to go back to their communities, there should be funding and wraparound services for that particular individual as they, if they come into um, our county or other counties in the state of California. Because if individuals do not have the resources and if they are not in programs that are going to rehabilitate them, then we know what's going to happen. They're gonna reoffend and get back into the system. So uh, as we move forward in looking at these two policies, uh, we need to put uh, stronger languages and resources attached to them. Okay, like Johnny Camas, I voted no on both of those. And when I look at my propositions, I look at who's in support of and who's against. And I was siding with law enforcement on voting no for both of those, I believe, at the time. I can't quite remember. Um, I don't think I would support another proposition coming out on either of these, but I would support tweaking these propositions in the legislature. And I also would like to take a look at some statistics on the root causes of crime in regards to how income inequality is as it relates to crime and also family structure, data on family structures and how that, how that, where crime comes from as far as 
strong functional families or dysfunctional families, because if we strengthen families, I think we'll, it would help our crime statistics. And if we lessen income inequality, I think that would also lessen our crime statistics. But in direct answer to the question, I voted no on both of those, I believe. Thank you. So what we need to do when we make decisions about criminal justice issues is by actually looking at the facts and looking at the statistics. And these two measures are different in their impact. Prop 47, uh, 57 was merely to provide greater rehabilitation, which is a really positive thing, and it has been successful in many places. Prop 47, on the other hand, has reduced various crimes to misdemeanors, and it is true, statistically, the Public Policy Institute of California has, has analyzed this, that there are more break-ins into cars, and that is the one thing that has gone up. However, uh, Wiener has, Scott Wiener has introduced a bill recently, SB 23, to improve the ability to prosecute for burglaries. And the problem was not that they were burglaries, it's because of the way it was defined in the law. Uh, next question starts with Johnny. Will you vote for or against the Reducing Crime and Keeping California Safe Act of 2020? Yeah, I think I just said I would, and I'm actually a, sign, a, a signer onto that ballot measure. Um, I think it was called the Safer California Act, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but because it changed names. Uh, the fact of the matter is, we, my office did statistics on how many people have been released in jail just after Prop 47. So far, 5,234 people have been released under the reassessment of Prop 47. These, these folks um, are just in Santa Clara County over the last four years, 5,234. And, uh, you know, we were promised full rehabilitation. I don't see most of those people being rehabilitated, quite frankly. And I think that's adding to our homelessness problems, our, our drug addicted folks who are living in, in the streams. The, these people need to be helped a lot more with the money that we're saving from our prison system. I'm going to support uh, policies that actually and laws that actually make sure that we are re rehabilitating our individuals and if they are not um, uh, moving into that direction then I think we need to reevaluate what we are putting on the ballot um, so that's where I'm at right now and um, if I see something that sways me another way then I would um, move forward in that direction as I stated, I'm not really in uh, favor of trying to rectify past mistakes of previous propositions with another proposition. I think I'd rather see this done at the legislator, um, way, tweak, tweaking it via that. Um, I haven't looked at this ballot measure, but right now I'd have to say I'm leading, leaning toward no hearing what I'm hearing about it. Um, Propositions on top of propositions can cause, could probably end up causing more problems, but that's where I am. I would not support it. Uh, putting people behind bars is not a cost-effective or effective way of dealing with the issue of crime. Rehabilitation has shown to be a positive way, and those people in prison, it costs $85,000 a year for an inmate in prison in California. <clears throat> really, what we need to do is look at the better funding which was supposed to exist to provide those programs for rehabilitation so that we can see the effectiveness of them in the future. No, I, I don't intend to support the Safer uh, California Act. <clears throat> for similar reasons that have been stated uh, by some of the others up here. There's tweaking that should be looked at. I, I don't know another, a better word for it. it. That doesn't sound like a very uh, uh, public safety or justice oriented word. Uh, but we do have um, meth um, uh, 
um, addiction uh, epidemic going on out here, um, including in our county. Um, it is problematic when you're returning people right back to the same addictive circumstances almost immediately um, without rehabilitation, um, without the investment that needs to go into it, without uh, beds uh, that, where they can be stabilized for 30 days. Um, we need to invest even more Mental Health Services Act money, which is a different proposition, um, you know, into those areas. But I do think that if there's unintended consequences with those propositions, it's not worth throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's about going in there and taking a look at, okay, what has really happened now? And the other thing is you, you just have to have enforcement. You have to have enforcement uh, and you have to have enough city cops, which is a problem here in San Jose. Okay. Next question, starting with... Oh, rebuttal. Yeah, I, I'd have to correct that. We, we, we will never have enough cops in here in San Jose, but since I've been in office, we've had a, a huge increase. We've, we've fixed some of the problems that we've had with our police unions uh, with Measure F. We hired 300 in the last two years. And, uh, but I could tell you from our police officers' points of view that they are supporting this, uh, this new Safer California Act because they don't see a way to actually punish people anymore. Yeah, so first of all, when I was uh, vice mayor of the city of San Jose, we talked about that in the opening, we had 1,350 police officers. Um, as, as recently as two years ago, the city still had only 850 police officers. Of course, police officers are gonna support stronger me uh, measures like this if they're undermanned or if they're understaffed out there. Again, you know, San Jose's a, got a unique issue of having beat everybody up over pensions and losing 500 officers. Uh, you don't have what you used to have, and you should have a lot more. And there's only one rebuttal per round, so if you want to bring it up later. Oh, Anne. Yeah, let, me, I'm sorry. Uh, let me just add, the statistics are very clear that in Santa Clara County, we are among the lowest uh, counties in the entire state for the number of arrests. Um, and actually, there's only Amador and San Francisco, which is a much smaller county than ours, that has fewer arrests. So I think that um, the, the views of the police in this case um, certainly are, are what they believe, but it's, doesn't, it's not borne out. Anyone else? And, that didn't, and just a reminder, to on, I said round, but every question is allows for a rebuttal. So I think this next one, we're starting, starting with Nora Campos. Um, how would you have voted on SB 54, which limited cooperation between local law enforcement and federal law enforcement, uh, often referred to as sanctuary state policy? Um, thank you for this question. Um, the city of San Jose is a sanctuary city. California is also a sanctuary state. Um, I will support the law. And if um, someone is, uh, has committed a crime, then they need to be prosecuted with full weight of, their, um, of the legal system. Um, but what troubles me about this is, as a nation, I don't believe that we should allow ourselves to be baited into profiling people based on their ethnic and their makeup. And I believe we're better than that. So I, um, I, I just can't see us going down that, that road. And, and I would hope that the rhetoric that is coming at the federal level uh, from the individual that's in the White House is not bringing light to something that we should not be um, addressing. Okay, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna reference some teachings of Moses from Hebrews and Jesus on this for, for give you a personal perspective on how I feel about immigration. Uh, Moses talked about welcoming the stranger in the land. In Hebrews it says to show hospitality to strangers. And Jesus also talked about when he makes a judgment on welcoming strangers. Very, I'm very much in favor of helping people that want to come here that are trying to escape bad situations. So I would favor SB 54, but my concern on that, I favored SB 54, but my concern is the criminal aspect of it. Uh, criminals, criminal activity, you're coming here to try to escape a bad situation and try to get a better life, I'm all for that. But if you're going to come here and commit crimes, kill, rape, uh, deal drugs, no. 
So I, that's my concern about that. I'm willing to favor protecting the innocent if it means we're going to get a little overflow on, on um, the crime, but I really would like to change that so that the criminal aspect is really addressed. Thank you. I would not um, have... Uh, I, I would have voted for it for because I believe also in sanctuary and I believe in having the people who live here feel safe in the community. What people don't know about the state sanctuary policy is there are mechanisms that an arresting officer or a, or a prisoner jail can utilize if they think someone is dangerous and is going to and is going to commit a felony or some other heinous crime to notify ICE if they get a magistrate to agree that that person is dangerous. So it's not an accurate um, depiction of the law to say that it's really what's causing these murders from people who are um, in who are dangerous individuals yes I think one of the other misunderstandings and I think it, some of it comes from national rhetoric is that somehow people who commit crimes violent crimes if they're undocumented that they're shielded somehow from prosecution they are not um, if somebody commits a violent crime a homicide a rape a violent assault or, or any else for that matter any kind of felony is prosecuted to the full extent of the law just like somebody who's documented they will go to uh, San Quentin or whatever state prison they need to go to and serve their time if they get a life sentence they'll serve a life sentence um, that's all the same here documented or undocumented in California and in Santa Clara County um, SB 54 has a list of about 800 crimes that uh, where uh, sheriffs, police chiefs, DAs can cooperate um, with ICE under the law. Um, I think the list is, is plenty adequate. Um, if what you're trying to do beyond prosecution is um, have make sure that ICE has the information they need to, to come and pick somebody up. Uh, that's really what this whole thing is about and um, it's really not a problem here in Santa Clara County as far as I'm concerned. Well, I beg to differ with that viewpoint. Um, the the uh, county has a much stricter uh, sanctuary policy than the state. The state does allow dangerous criminal, criminals to be uh, picked up by ICE. And uh, I'm an immigrant. I could tell you that I actually left the Republican Party because of, of what Trump was saying about immigrants. I'm disgusted by the rhetoric. But when it comes to dangerous people, I think they should be off the streets. Um, there was a, a member of our community here that lost her life because our, our, our criminal laws are t so laxed and the sanctuary county policy uh, was not there for any, any cooperation with ICE. Um, I've actually written letters for the county to actually change the policy to allow for a simple phone call and that did not happen. Uh, next question, I think we're starting with Tim. Uh, if given the opportunity to vote, would you support the state providing free health care to undocumented individuals, and if so, why? Ooh, okay. Uh, I've already come out and said I support universal health care, but remember, on every one of these issues, you, the voters, can overrule me on this. I'm in favor, if you go overseas and you need medical care, you can get, you can get help if you're an American citizen in another country. So I, I just view that when it comes to health, anybody should be able to get care if they need it. We shouldn't be discriminating against somebody who's undocumented. So universal health care means that's gonna, we're going to help anybody and anyone that needs health, health care, health assistance. And I know this would cost a lot of money. And again, if the voters don't want to go this direction, I'm not going to vote for something like that. But if health care is a human right, we have to consider ourselves pooling ourselves, pooling together our resources to assist other people who have uh, very troubling health care needs. Thank you. Yeah, I don't need to use a lot of my time. I absolutely th think that it's also a human right to give health care, and we do not want people in our community who are so sick and are like dying in the streets. Uh, what we want is to extend 
the compassion that we should have for all people who are here, whether they are documented or undocumented, everyone should have basic health care. Uh, yes, I would not deny um, either education or health care services to, um, to anybody um, who's a resident um, in the community, regardless of status. Um, and keep in mind that you know, the question presupposes that somehow we're keeping a registry that we're profiling people every time they come in to, uh, a, to a safety net service provider, to a school, um, and somehow we're trying to find out whether or not um, they're documented or whether or not they're uh, Catholic, Muslim, Jew, Protestant, or whatever. We don't do that here. It's typically um, not done in the United States of America. Um, and um, we don't, on top of that, from a humanitarian standpoint, um, we don't want sick kids um, running around in our schools, um, not only making other people sick, um, but potentially you know, a threat to their own lives. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with Dave that we actually already have um, uh, services that, that un anybody can use. It, it's called you know, the emergency rooms, Valley Med is available. There are already services that, um, that exist. Um, the question is, do we want universal health care? I think that's a different topic altogether. That is a very expensive avenue to go down, um, but, but the services for sick people are there already. They can go to an emergency room today and, and be served. I think it's a humane way of dealing with people, I, and I w wouldn't take the emergency rooms away. Healthcare is a basic human right, and everyone should have access to health care. Um, the state of California has, is now covering our dreamers through Covered California, and everyone should have the ability, and we should be creating an infrastructure that everyone has access to health care. It's a basic human right. Next question starts with Anne. How would you have voted on SB 50, Scott Weiner's bill, in its final iteration? Yes or no? Yes or no? Well, at some point in the <laughs> answer would be nice. Yes or no? I would have voted no. And the reason that I would vote no on SB 50 is um, there are two reasons. While I believe there needs to be housing near transit, I agree with the idea that there has to be some requirement for housing. But two things. That bill only addressed housing. It did not talk about moderate or low income affordable housing. And that is a concern because I think the real need we have in this county is for moderate low income housing, for teachers, for firefighters, not for people who are buying $2 million houses. So that's the, the main reason, but also I believe in local control. I believe that every community is different, and so people have a right to have different uh, looks in what's appropriate in their community. Well, in a way, I did get to vote on it because um, I'm a member, um, a long standing member of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Association of Bay Area Governments, and we were asked to take a position on the bill. Um, in its final iteration, and uh, my position in uh, the motion I supported, I may have even made it, was um, that we'll support the bill when there's amendments or modifications to the bill um, in the areas of height limits, parking ratios, and, and when the bill is, is focused on restricted to transit rich areas and communities. Um, so the short answer would have been in, in its final iteration, no, I would not have voted for it. I, we called for amendments. Um, the bill then was suspended in, uh, in, in committee. Uh, I understand Senator Weiner is attempting to make amendments now. He's starting to, to work on his amendments and we'll expect to see it back again probably in January. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if, if these amendments um, that I was part of calling for are part of the new package. No, no, I would not have voted for it. Um, I believe in local government control. If, um, 
uh, and, but I do believe in higher density. I think I've voted many, many times to increase the density in the city of San Jose, especially along uh, the uh, tra train corridors. In fact, I've written memos to reduce costs uh, in, in building uh, along the, the light rail corridor and the train corridors. Um, however, I do believe in some local government control. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think it's right that local government shouldn't have some control that, that, and the community shouldn't be able to, uh, you know, have a say so in these decisions, so. You know, housing is an issue that we're all figuring out, not just at, locally, but I think at the state. And I think that as we move forward, we have to remember that everyone should have the ability to be able to have a roof over their head. And in order for families to be healthy, they need to have shelter. And locally, when you think about San Jose and all the surrounding cities, we're not doing the best job that we need to do. And I would support bills whether they're at the local level or at the state level, that actually build housing on transit corridors and also build housing around our job centers. And if we don't get bold about building housing, we're gonna continue to have the situations that we have around um, unhoused individuals. Next question, Tim, have you gone? I apologize. No, you still have to go, Tim, right? Okay, I would also vote no because of the reasons already mentioned, but I would be really tempted. I know the intent was to try to really do something about the housing crisis, and I respect Scott Wiener's concern about that, but the amendments, as already been mentioned, it needed amendments. I wanna say that I believe housing is a human right. Um, everybody should be housed. Um, so that's my position on that, but I would have voted no, thank you. Wanting amendments. Hey, thank you. Going on to the next question, starting with Dave. Do you support eliminating single-family home zoning, as Oregon has done, which would allow three- and four-unit buildings to replace single-family homes by right, meaning not approval of a local city council? We've had legislation pending in the state of California that would attempt to do that, including some suggested by Senator Weiner as all, uh, provisions that he's um, come up with. Um, Again, I err on the side of, of local control on the, those issues, being um, having dealt with land use, uh, just like you have, Mr. Oliverio, as a city council member and as a county supervisor. Um, you can't have a one-size-fits-all approach to all single family and all neighborhoods all the time. I do think there is probably lots of opportunity, um, instead of having three or four families in a unit, in a single family unit, to, to take that lot and turn it into three or four individual homes, be them townhomes or whatever they might be, um, to, to house people in a, in a better, more efficient, and maybe even more humanitarian way. Um, but those are decisions pr predominantly that local government needs to make. Um, so by right is um, a little strong for me. Um, to enable local governments to, to do that more readily, to uh, more quickly override their own general plans, uh, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, I also would not do a one-size-fits-all policy. Uh, I've supported ADUs, for example. We've actually reduced the cost. We've reduced the, the paperwork. We even have an ADU Tuesday to help people uh, increase housing in the city of San Jose. Uh, we need to start thinking outside the box. Uh, there's so much regulations and fees involved in housing. It, it, it drives up the cost of housing. It takes lot, much longer because of CEQA and other laws that, that create huge impediments to building housing. We need to look at how to make it easier to build housing and not just these, these big, broad brushes. Take a look at the real problem. Why does it take so long? Why does it cost so much? And those, those issues that are the ones that we should be tackling. You know, we're having this uh, forum right here in Willow Glen, which is a phenomenal neighborhood. You have gotten it right when you think about being able to work, live, and um, play and dine in your own area. Um, I, I don't believe that when we create policies 
that um, we're saying it's going to fit across the city of San Jose or sh across California, um, that one size fits all. Um, so I, I think we need to tread cautionly when we think about that. But as I ha will continue to say, we do need to think about policies that will actually support building more housing in our um, communities and our cities where housing is extremely expensive so that individuals don't have to have three families living in one particular home or unit. Um, I think that the tiny homes is a way to go. So um, thank you for the question. Okay, one of the things about being down the line is you hear a lot of things you agree with, so a lot of the things I've already heard I agree with. One size fits all is definitely not something I, is definitely not a philosophy I like at all. Um, again, housing, I like the idea of housing being in local control um, in this particular aspect, but I would, I'd, be, I'd be against what was mentioned in the question, thank you. It sounds like we're all unanimous here. Um, I, I certainly feel the same way. I know there are neighborhoods, Sacramento has them, where there's single family homes together with apartments right next to each other. Um, but then there are places like uh, the older parts of Willow Glen that don't have that. And if it was forced in a vacant home that it could be would have to be torn down to build a triplex or more, I think it would be inappropriate for the neighborhood and people would be upset. And lack of a voice in our democracy and in decisions about our communities, I think is really inappropriate to do because people feel better about building housing when they have a say in the look and a say in how it's built. Okay, hey, next question starting with Johnny. Uh, California has 25% of the USA's homeless. Building permanent housing will require billions of dollars of taxes increases and 20 to 30 years to build. What do you think the state should do now to help cities and these individuals? Well, th there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for homelessness. And what people are missing it is that 40, you know, in a, a recent uh, study done by Santa Clara County, 42% of the homeless population had mental health issues. 36% had drug addiction issues, and I'm, I'm sure that some of them are, uh, you know, a little of both. So if we're not looking at the causes of hopelessness and just thinking about the cost of, ho uh, of housing, we're not really addressing the, the real problems. We need to start building facilities to house the, the mentally ill with wraparound services. We're, we started doing that in the city of San Jose, but the state needs to do a whole lot more. We've been collecting tax revenues from Prop 63 since 2004 for mental health and mental wellness, um, but we didn't, we didn't see any of those dollars translated into actual housing and services for those uh, for me the, the mental Ill, mentally ill. Another issue that we've been dealing with here in the city of San Jose, where do we house our homeless? Um, when I was in the assembly, we created a bill, AB 2176, which actually would allow the city of San Jose to build tiny homes on government property and I know that they've been going, they've gone through a process and continue to do, go through processes which allow the community to have a voice on where the tiny homes will be built. And um, our mayor currently, along with some of his uh, colleagues, were able to build some of those homes for our unhoused population. And if we're going to be able to move forward and address this homeless issue, then we have to build housing. And we've got to be bold. And, it, and I know it's a hard issue for us all to think about uh, because we don't necessarily want low-income housing in our communities, but we need to address this issue. Okay. Um, first for some temporary solutions, I support the idea of sanctioned tent encampments. 
Uh, we are 3.5 million housing units in arrears in the state. It is, and as this was mentioned, 20 years of building houses isn't going to happen overnight. So we've got to do some temporary solutions. And as Councilman Camus mentioned, we have a mentally ill problem and a substance abuse problem. We've got to get to some of those root causes. Um, substance abuse is something that Senator Bell addresses. I want to continue that type of issue going on. That's a big problem in California and the nation. A uh, mental illness is a big problem. That is, those are some of the roots that are creating homelessness. But sanctioned encampments, I was, as I've said, I was for uh, the Proposition 10, which would return rent control to the local municipalities and a much more controlled approach to housing, temporarily at least. Thank you. I, I believe that uh, having homeless on the streets like we have both in this neighborhood and throughout San Jose and the community is essentially a human rights problem and I think it is absolutely inappropriate. And each of these groups is different and how you deal with them, it's been referenced already. There's people who are drug addicted, there's people who are mentally ill, and then there's families, and there's single women with children. There's so many different ways that we have to address the housing problem, and there should be some temporary housing because they shouldn't be on the street, as was suggested, and I think there's other places that it could be. I know the county didn't want him on the fairgrounds, but you know there are places where we could have temporary housing, but also we need to have permanent supportive housing for everyone. And I supported that Governor, Governor Newsom just, <laughs> Governor Newsom just uh, vetoed it, but I supported Jim Bell's bill to use tax increment funding. And then Dave, uh, hurry up and talk I'll do the, it on the phone before, and, before the timer comes yeah. back on. Well, it's it's busted. I'll I'll just call it out. Just <laughs> starting now. Thank thank you. So, when you passed the uh, measure A, the nine hundred fifty million dollar housing bond, you the voters by a two thirds majority, um, what that did is give us seven hundred million of that bond for permanent supportive housing. The S. The PS in the PSH, Permanent Supportive Housing, is the wraparound services. So people who get those apartments get mental health services, social services, uh, all the services they need literally right at their door. We already have that money because we're spending that money on them now. In fact, we're spending too much money on them now because they keep coming in and out of the system. Thanks to you, the voters, there's 19 projects that we have matched up money with out of that $700 million. We have drawn down $250 million of it already. But we're the only county that has something that big, that significant for permanent supportive housing. We need it statewide. Um, and something else I would like people to understand is we have, we need another bucket of money statewide for transitional housing, for short-term housing. That's why you don't see people coming out of tents and you see more tents going up. They can't wait for the long-term housing to be built and we just don't have short-term shelters here in California. I think this one starts with Nora, right? Yeah, yeah. can I can oh. I say about that? I rebuttal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, look, the the county has had opportunities to convert, you know, the, the old city hall, for example, to convert the jails, um, the current jail that the, is being um, is going to be bulldozed over. Um, the county has had opportunities to convert some of this property and has not done so. In fact, the annex would would have been paid for twenty million by nonprofits to <laughs> re-seismically retrofit and make that into a 160 unit complex in two years and they voted no to make it into a valet parking lot. Yeah, can, I, can I speak to that? I mean, it's, just, it's just not true. Uh, the fact of the matter is if you were at the last board meeting or if you watch the tape, you will see that there's a plan for uh, short-term and permanent supportive housing on the old city hall site and that's moving forward and we're going to be putting a lot of pressure on the city council to make sure to approve those plans as soon as we get that application formally filed. Um, turning uh, the old rat infested former city hall that the city had abandoned there for ten and a half years um, into, um, into housing of some sort wasn't going to work. 
Uh, well, I disagree with that. Um, the city hall was purchased by the county 10 years ago, more or less. So that was, San, that was the county's responsibility. And they could have rat infested or not, the 20 million could have made it into a, like a dormitory kind of with people with their own rooms and doors and locks that they could live in instead of being on the streets. <laughs> So I, th I think that uh, um, Johnny Camus is right about this. You know, I, um, I'm listening to the, 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 uh, the discussion here. And, you know, when I put my bill forward, AB 2176, it included the city and the county. And the county opt out. And when we're talking about transition housing or housing that transitions into permanent housing, that's what the tiny homes do. And, um, you know, I never got an explanation why they decided to opt out. Um, so we've, if we are talking about transitional housing, they, we had an opportunity to do it. The city of San Jose made that happen. Okay, staying with you, uh, Nora. The LPS Act of 1972 is the current law of the state and does not allow long-term involuntary treatment of those suffering from severe mental illness such as schizophrenia. Would you support modifying the definition within that law of gravely disabled uh, to allow involuntary treatment for those who suffer from severe mental illness? Um. Involuntary, involuntary treatment. Um, I haven't put a lot of thought into this particular question. I'm going to be completely honest. And I don't, I, you know, mental health is an issue that we're dealing with at the state. And um, I, you know, I, I, I would need to think about this one a little bit more, to be honest with you. Um, it's it's a, an issue that when I was in the assembly, and I was chair of public safety, what I did support was to make sure that we put pots of money that went into facilities that actually helped um, individuals with mental um, illness issues and um, wraparound services that continue to support that. Um, and I think that uh, we need to continue to put pots of money that support individuals with mental health. Okay, the idea of involuntary puts a red flag up for me right away. Uh, I have a brother, he's mentally ill. He has a conservator, and the conservator, and I chose to do it that way, uh, to allow, since the conservator was the expert. So, within the system, anyone who can, it would take a little bit, they can get a conservator. But the idea of involuntarily forcing treatment on somebody, very concerned about that idea, so I'd have to say no to that. Um, but still within the system, uh, conservators can be con assigned to those who are mentally ill. Thank you. Actually, I've, I tried about 100 LPS cases when I first started the county, and there were parents with teenagers who were mentally ill, who were schizophrenic, who were a, they, a danger to them, and they could not get conservatorships because of the way the law is structured. And clearly what we need is to be able to change the law that was intended for people who were getting lobotomies against their will to people who can humanely get drug treatment that will stabilize them so they can become a part of society and ultimately, hopefully, get jobs and, and be more productive as opposed to lying in the streets in downtown San Jose. So this is absolutely essential to be done in this community. It's being done in San Francisco, it's being done in San Diego, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I don't think it's right to be messing around with the definition of what is uh, severely mentally ill. That should be a medical definition. It shouldn't be a political definition. It, frankly, it shouldn't be a law enforcement definition. And um, one of the things that I'm committed to doing is to continue to move our, our mental health 
uh, programs and our whole mental health system um, more and more to toward um, a health care platform instead of uh, a, a criminal platform. Um, if somebody were to have an episode in this room right now um, and somebody else w you know, broke their leg, fell off their chair, and we called 911, um, who would show up for the broken leg? EMTs. Who shows up for the mental health episode? People with badges and guns. And it, it's not an appropriate system. It's not an appropriate system for a teenager um, or an adult. And, and we've got to work on that. It is an inhumane, brutal system right now. Um, and they will lock people up at the EPS if you bring somebody in with an episode tonight. Yeah, well, I've been advocating for something called Laura's Law. It was passed in 2002, um, and it's, it has to pass county by county. It's a, conservative, it's a temporary conservatorship law that allows people to get the help that they need. In fact, it helps parents with mentally ill children have a conservator. Uh, and I'm, I've been 100% in favor of, of it after I found out that it could be implemented in the county of Santa Clara that has chosen not to implement it. Uh, since, uh, since then, I've been advocating every year during our meetings to have them consider it because it's been working in, in every, every county that has tried it. It's been working. It helps the mentally, severely mentally ill that are on the streets that can't take care from, of themselves and are in trouble with the law. And it's temporary. It's, it's 90 days at a time, renewable for another 90 days, and a judge has to order it. And we can't get that across the finish line at the county. And, and it's inhumane to not help these people. Anne? Could I add one thing with respect to that? It is worse to take mentally ill people to jail against their will, where they often get beaten up they do not get treatment, they are not stabilized. So this is a much more humane way to stabilize people and make them be productive. Okay, next question I think starts with Tim. Uh, do you support the legislature's actions to make police misconduct records public? Uh, again, when I've read about this, my, yes, what, I, what I'm concerned about this I'm listening to the law enforcement, and they seem to be con have uh, definite re concerns about it. I would have to say uh, no. I think it is very crucial for there to be transparency in all government activities, including misconduct by police officers, so that it's public and you understand the ways that the police have dealt with those within their ranks who have done things that are inappropriate. This is a public right, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, the laws currently allow, um, through the law, through the motion process, um, for uh, those records to be released for cause. Um, sometimes they are, oftentimes they're not, but we need to remember that we're dealing with personnel records of police officers um, on the employment side. It, it would be to them um, uh, no, no less uh, similar than uh, if somebody asked for your personal records at your job and said there should be transparency whether you're a county employee, a city employee, or whatever. There is a personnel privilege. Um, I think they're doing a, a pretty good job debating this in the legislature right now to find a balance as to when and how much information should be released. And, and certainly if somebody has a, a record of excessive use of force, um, that information needs to come out. I think that's where the transparency needs to be. Um, but it, it's, it's going to take continue to work to, to get to that point. I mean, there's actually already a lot of public, public records uh, abilities already out there. But being a police officer is a little different. People complain, if, if you're meeting a police officer, you're not having a good day. Uh, and they get a lot more complaints, and some of them aren't valid. So to give the number of complaints just like that, uh, without actually making sure that that complaint is justified, I think it's unfair to some police officers. These things have to be vetted 
uh, before, and then we have an independent police officer, independent police auditor in our city that handles complaints from, uh, from uh, the public. And after those complaints have been vetted, we actually let people know how many complaints um, were and what kind they were um, in a report that comes out every year. So we do that to some extent, but not every complaint against a police officer is a problem. You know, Johnny, I think um, I agree with you on this one. Um, you know, as um, I was at City Hall when we first had our independent police auditor, and at that time she was um, uh, developing an infrastructure to be able to address these issues. Um, it's a personnel issue, uh, and I know that uh, currently right now the um, when they come into session, the Assembly and the Senate are looking at how to address this issue. It's a very sensitive issue. And I would have to say that it, you just can't release a, f um, a record at the request without going through a process to make sure that uh, we're releasing uh, information that is um, valid to the, to, to the public. Uh, next question starts with Ann. Do you uh, support completing high-speed rail? If so, what type of tax would you support to pay for it, or what other money would you take away to pay for it? I do support completing high-speed rail. I think it was a, a really good idea, um, and it <clears throat> would be one way to deal with some of the crucial housing uh, job housing balance that we have in this valley and it will also aid the Central Valley in particular uh, economically. Uh, you know, I, the way to pay for it is a question and that's always true about the state budget. When, and part of the issue about doing budgets is prioritization, but there's several things that I think could happen at the state level that don't, and it may not be able to be enough to pay for high-speed rail, but it is, there's got to be more auditing oversight over the state, because it isn't done now to determine whether people are actually doing what they should be doing in different departments. I've always supported high-speed rail as a project. Um, the idea of moving people back and forth up and down the state um, and to different um, technology parks uh, and education centers up and down the state is not a new idea anywhere else in the world. Um, in Taiwan, um, they've connected five science parks um, with two-hour high-speed rail that crisscrosses the island with a public-private partnership. And this was supposed to be built with a public-private partnership um, and with federal dollars that aren't materializing. So I think. Currently, we have to acknowledge the fact that the governor has told us there's not money uh, for this. Um, this this administration uh, in Washington, D.C. has um, done everything they can to try to take money away from it. Um, so I don't think it's a, a project that's going to happen anytime soon. But I think for our, our children and our grandchildren and their children, we have to be trying to keep up with the rest of the world to make sure that we have um, this kind of connectivity to, again, to employment centers and commerce centers up and down the state. Yeah, you know, it, it is so much over budget and, and so much, uh, it's, go, it's gone so far down the wrong direction that I cannot support it at this time. Um, right now, the city of San Jose is actually looking at Hyperloop, you know, as an alternative. It may be, that might be the right way to do it. It might be faster and much cheaper. Uh, we were actually looking at connecting um, San Jose along Stevens Creek and then also Diridon Station to the airport with a mini Hyperloop, mini Hyperloop projects. Um, and that, that could end up being the right way. I think the fact that it's being built from nowhere to nowhere is not a great idea. It's not gonna help anyone at this point. I supported High Speed Rail when I was in the assembly. Uh, I had the opportunity to be able to sit on a committee that actually uh, worked with uh, the, the board, the governing body that um, oversaw uh, high-speed rail. Um, I think that if we're going to make this happen, uh, we need to 
make sure that we're looking at state bonds, uh, federal transportation, those are some of them, but uh, it is something that definitely needs to happen in California. If we are going to get people off our freeways and make sure that individuals are not spending two to three hours coming into Silicon Valley, then in their cars, we need to make sure that we are creating a transportation system that works for all Californians. Okay, I agreed with what Dave said and also what Nora said. Ideologically, I agree with it. However, the problem is the money, as we know, and I actually think it should go back to the voters. I'm not, I'm not, I, I wonder if the voters would even app approve of it this time around. But if it went back to the voters with an option to increase state bonds. So I, ideologically, I agree with it. I voted yes on it, but I kind of think it should go back to the voters and ask, do they want to continue going this route or do we want to stop it? Do we, can, and also at the same time asking for more money for via bonds. Thank you. Okay, final question for Dave and then the closing statements. What specific legislation would you vote in favor to, to help reduce negative effects of climate change? Would these changes impact residents' current lifestyles or pocketbook, for example, raising gas, utility taxes, car registration fees, eliminating single-use plastics, uh, free parking, eliminating uh, single-family homes to save water, et cetera? Yeah, we've done a lot of those things, of course, in Santa Clara County. And uh, just a couple weeks back, um, I was asked um, on behalf of uh, the Climate um, Restoration Foundation, which is affiliated with the United Nations, to go to the United Nations and do a global call to action for local governments um, to, to, to do some of the things that we're doing here. Many of those are things that you just rattled off in your question. As a state senator, we have to remember that 60% of our GHG um, our greenhouse gases are coming from the tailpipe, are coming from emissions. And so irrespective of revenue schemes or anything else, we have to continue to regulate emissions in the state and we have to be a leader um, among others, not just here but globally, to do the same thing. That's not the posture of, of the White House right now, um, but it needs to continue to be the posture here. We have to attack what we can attack first and foremost. Um, I have been involved in something called Plan Bay Area, which is our regional plan here, which um, um, plans housing and transportation closer together to reduce vehicle trips and again reduce the amount of emissions that are coming from vehicles that uh, use fossil fuels. Yeah, well, and, and City Council actually uh, in put forward a, uh, a program called the Mower Blower Buyback that will help uh, people with their two stroke. Um, mowers and blowers uh, turn their turn their equipment into electric um, electric mower and blower systems, and I think it. I think if we did that statewide, m believe it or not, the, uh, those mower and blowers take took put more uh, carbon dioxide than an eight-cylinder engine because there's they're not filtered. Um, so that's one way we could we could look at things taking that statewide. Um, we need to start looking at the ways we recycle plastic. Other countries actually take it and turn it into other materials. We take it and ship it across the world, and then we don't know what happens to that. It may be burned and actually causing harm to the environment. We don't know what happens when it hits the shores of Vietnam or China. We, do they treat it as, as well as we would treat it here? I think we need to look at recycling here in California, turning our materials into new materials. I think one of the things that I would definitely start off uh, doing is creating um, a policy that gets individuals in sustainable homes. Um, when I was in the assembly, I, and I know it may seem like a minor uh, change, but when you go to create an infrastructure for your lawns and your water system, you now have to uh, abide by the new rules of the different materials that you have to use. So that was something that I think is going to change on how we conserve water when we're watering our lawns. Um, the other thing that I think that we also need to do is making sure that uh, we create a system that is inclusive for everyone, regardless of your social economics, when we talk about uh, being able to buy vehicles. Um, not every individual can afford a brand new hybrid. 
uh, but maybe there's incentives for individuals who want to buy a used hybrid. Okay, uh, I think the data is overwhelming that we have an environmental crisis globally. That's my position on that. Um, I like the directions our state is going. Unfortunately, the federal government is trying to push us backwards on it. That's very unfortunate. Uh, some of the things I'd like to see environmentally is a recycling. I'd like to see a recycling hotline where we had a 24-7, 365 recycling hotline where people are confused about how to recycle whatever things they have that they, they would know where the places they are to go. They, also have a, they could also text. They would know where these things are supposed to go. Um, by the way, I'm against fracking. I, I, I don't like the idea of fracking. Uh, electric vehicles, there'll be a, cut a time where we're just going to go strictly with electrical ve electric vehicles in the state with subsidies for those who are lower income so they can afford them. And I think Nora, Nora also mentioned the water conservation definitely need to be much more outspoken about that in the state. Thank you. I, I think that um, all of the proposals that have been made are very good, but they really don't deal with the serious problems that we have. Uh, for example, when you talk about vehicles, yes, there's a lot of vehicles on the road that are still emitting uh, carbon into the, into the air, but the largest numbers are uh, uh, big trucks, the lar and those, those actually drive more distances, it's the rail, it's the boats, and what we need to do is figure out um, through investment in the state the capacity to have bigger and better, and I know people are already working on this, but it needs to be done with some state investment of how to be able to retain more solar, more wind energy, and how to have better batteries that will be utilized for those larger trucks because we don't have them now. Thank you. And now it's time for uh, one minute closing comments and we're going in reverse al alphabetical order starting with Anne. Thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody's attention. Nobody fell asleep. Um, I um, am really anxious to be working in the State Senate because so many issues that we've talked about today have not been dealt with. And they're not dealt with in part because there is a problem with our government integrity and ethics and with the money. I mean, we talk about uh, the fact that money that goes from oil companies to Democratic senators in the state has had an impact on fracking, it's had an impact on oil production, and so all of these issues that have caused problems in our state have not been fixed by people who are not so interested in working for the people themselves and are more concerned about their donors. Thank you. Uh, Johnny? Thank you. I, so, as, as a council member, I have to say I have been working t as a collaborative person. Uh, we worked on many issues with Pierre Luigi, for example, we worked on uh, getting religious institutions to house people that were unhoused in their facilities. We've, we've, I've supported every single housing project that came across our desk. We've looked for innovative ways to house people. Um, and, and then we also look for innovative ways to streamline processes. I've worked uh, to streamline the processes on, on, on um, housing remodels. And now it's much easier and cheaper to actually get your home rebuilding permit um, at City Hall. Uh, you know, I, you, since you've been listening to me for a while, you may think that I don't support any taxes. Well, I have supported taxes, but I support taxes when it comes uh, when they have accountability measures. I supported the Measure T, where we had 300 million dedicated to uh, pavement, and now our streets are going to get paved. And so I'm hoping that it brings the same results-oriented leadership to the state senate. Tim. Okay, uh, again, I will be, I am taking no money, so my allegiance is going to be strictly to the voters, always. And in every, any race I run from here on out, if, will always, will, I will take this vow never to take any money. It's always going to be allegiance to the voters. 
and I think it can be done. And I'd rather lose and operate that way than win by taking money. Um, and I've said that I support tuition-free education. I support universal health care. Housing is a human right. We have to take a more controlled stance. Um, again, I also think we have to make a decision. Do we want to help our neighbors? It's going to cost money to help other people. Is that a direction we want to go, or do we not want to go that direction? I'm personally in favor of, of more taxation and more and sharing the, the wealth, so to speak, to help our neighbors. But if my voters don't want that, then I have to consider that. Thank you. Dave? Well, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks to the Wilga Neighborhood Association for putting this on. Um, it's been great. The questions have been um, very technical and, and sort of deep questions. Um, but, you know, I have been um, working closely with your neighborhoods and with neighborhoods um, all over this Senate district for a long time, for a number of years, right up to this minute, and I'll continue doing that as a member of the Board of Supervisors. And I mentioned some of the issues early on that I've been working on, but I know at the end of the day, um, if you elect me, and I need your help for that to happen, um, what you're going to want to know is how are we going to clean up the litter around these freeway interchanges? How are we going to get the potholes filled uh, on the freeways where it feels like it's going to knock your shock absorbers out? Um, what's going to happen in terms of getting our fair share of resources for the homeless? How are we going to get people out of tents and into transitional housing? And what am I going to do to battle for the money up there? These are all things that I'm ready to land on my feet running and do. And more importantly, I'll be in, in constant contact with you, just like I have been as a county supervisor and as a city council member. There's a table back there. Please sign up to help our campaign. Nora? Thank you. First, I want to thank the Willigan community for hosting this forum. It gave us the opportunity to be able to share with you some of our views. And I know that they're pretty similar, but I think there are differences between each one of us. Uh, I have been in Sacramento. I served, and I think one of the most important committees that I was able to serve on is budget. And why is that important? Because when you're at the table around the budget, you get the opportunity to think and be able to express where you want to see funding go. And one of the things that I was very good at is making sure that as we were bringing money to the local levels that the city of San Jose and the surrounding cities were included. Being one of the most expensive places to live, we sometimes were not treated equally to some of the other parts of California. So you need to have a strong advocate and a leader that understands the state budget. Because when we think about who's going to represent us, you need to have a strong voice. Thank you, and I hope you consider my candidacy. And will you please join me in thanking our candidates with a round of applause. And a, Elizabeth, did you have a closing comment or? Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and spending your evening with us here and getting us all informed. It's really appreciated. I want to wish you all good luck, best of luck, and uh, have a great campaign. And thank you everyone here tonight. Remember, this is a Willow Glen Neighborhood Association. Um, and we are hoping that you guys, if you're not members yet, to sign up, become a member, get yourself a nice little Willow Glen card that will help not only us out at the Willow Glen Association. It will also help out uh, our, our local businesses. Um, it's a discount card for a lot of the places are on Lincoln Avenue, some on Meridian. It's throughout San Jose. And I want to thank everyone here tonight, and Deanna especially. Deanna Merzadagon. <laughs> thank you for putting this together. She's worked really hard. And, and Pierre Luigi, I cannot forget Pierre. He was our council member for two terms, 10 years, 10 years, my goodness. And he's everywhere in Willow Glen. So thank you, Pierre, for always being there for us. Good night, everyone. <laughs>